Hi everyone, my name is Hugo and welcome to Hugo's Desk. Just a quick intro. First off, thank you so much for watching my live stream. It was great. We had 2,771 views and a peak of 255 views. It was awesome. As promised, here is the edited version of the stream, only with the new compositing. No chatter, no giveaway, no interruptions. I've also added chapters so that you can jump into your preferred topic or skip any section. Of course, you can still watch the entire stream here. I would like to take this opportunity to thank my sponsors BankQ and Foundry for supporting and making these streams possible. You probably noticed that I use a lot of BankQ monitors. I currently use the BankQ SW321C for my grading work and the ultra-wide BankQ PD3420Q as my main desktop monitor. And last but not least, I use the BankQ PD2725U set up vertically so that I can use my coloscopes and my chat during the streams. Also, I would like to thank Foundry for all the support over the years. As you know, I have a lot of Nuke-related content on both my main channel and on my second channel. If you're interested, check out my previous streams where I teach Nuke for beginners. You can watch that playlist here. If you're even more interested to learn even more about Nuke compositing, you can also check out my complete Nuke course, endorsed by the Foundry. You can check out more information on this video. And that is it for me. On this video, we talk about blurs, defocusing, we go very deep into the ZD focus node, talk about making fog, and we also disconstruct a production shot. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe. This will really help to grow the channel and on my attempt to reach 100,000 subscribers. This would mean a lot to me and to my community and the channel would finally get a YouTube plaque and get certified. How cool would that be? But without further ado, let's get on with the video. Today we're going to be talking about blur, we're going to be talking about defocus, we're going to be talking about Z defocus, and then uh, if we have the time, I hope so, we're going to mainly try to see if we can really rushly comp this shot. This shot is from a cinematic I directed years ago, um, and it's a really nice shot to showcase the depth of field and to showcase like basically like the blurring. I, I like to show this, I like to use this, this shot for those kind of purposes and also because this shot looks pretty badass. So <laughs> that's also why. Um, but um, the, the main thing that, um, you know, this is from a, a, um, a cinematic I directed years ago. Uh, this was for Heroes Arena that I directed uh, many, many moons ago. And I'm very proud of this project. Uh, I was the director and also the VFX supervisor and lead composer of this project. Very proud of it. Um, let's watch a little bit of it, uh, just so that you can kind of see the type of shots that it has. I'm not going to put sound, but this is like a full cinematic trailer that I directed uh, in 2017. Uh, it was for Ucall, for Heroes Arena, and it was all created uh, remotely, even though it was in 2017. And this entire thing was done with Redshift, uh, Nuke, Udini, and Maya. Uh, we had about 20 people in total doing this entire project. Um, it's also on my website if you want to check it out. I'm very proud of this one uh, because it looks highly stylized, just like I like it. <laughs> it's the kind of thing, it's the kind of project I like. And, uh, you know, so that's why that's why I'm, I'm doing a shot from it. So I'm going to leave this for now. Like this, this, this trailer is quite big, so I'm not going to uh, watch the whole thing here with you. Uh, but it's quite badass, I think. I like it, at, at least. So let's go back to this. So that's why I wanted to use this shot. But before we use the shot, I wanted to like just uh, give you a little rundown of how depth of field blurring and defocusing works inside of Nuke. So keep in mind that there are many ways of blurring inside of Nuke. But the, today, we're going to be mostly talking about the stuff that can be found inside the filter tab. Uh, and in here we have the most important one, which is blur. Then the second most important one would be the defocus. But I think the the piece of the resistance would be the Z defocus. The Z defocus is really the most main and most important node if you want to develop some nice depth of field. Uh, and obviously there's PG bokeh as well. But we're not really going to talk about PG bokeh today. Just a, we're just going to like show it a little bit, but not really in depth because obviously PG bokeh is 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 separate. You know, it's like a third party plugin. So 
let's uh, start bringing them in. So we have the blur, we have the defocus, um, and then we have the Z defocus uh, nodes. And so the reason why I wanted to show you this, just like on the last Nuke for Dummies last month, we talked about the filters and we talked about certain things there. I wanted to show you really why and when should you use um, you know the defocus and why and when should you use uh, the blur you know so uh, consider this consider these two layers okay I'm gonna just gamma them up a little bit so that you can see them a bit better because these are raw from CG okay so consider this which is a background um, you know and so uh, this is basically like a CG background, then we have a character as well. Obviously, if I merge these two layers, A over B, just like we talked before on the Nuke for Dummies episodes, uh, if you do A over B, we basically can see that that's the main shot. This is uncomped, un unprocessed, you know, it's just raw CG, there's no depth of field, there's no atmospheres, the whole thing looks like this. Obviously, at the time, the thing that we did was like this. This was the final version with the client feedback and everything. Uh, we used um, a lot of um, uh, stock footage uh, from Action VFX, actually, uh, to actually process the Z depth and to have like some atmospherics going on on the background and everything. Uh, so, I think uh, obviously this is the full processed shot. Uh, looks looks a lot nicer than just the raw CG, but that's how it usually happens. Like you basically go from this, which is the raw CG, which tends to be pretty soft. It tends to be pretty uh, 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 grayed out, just so that you can balance it later. I prefer to do that. I prefer to have a more balanced shot and then kind of like process the 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 color correction later. And this, of course, is the final version with color correction, with depth of field, with everything. So this is the original CG that came out of uh, Redshift at the time. And this is the final comp. It has depth of field. It has chromatic aberration. It has glows. It has atmospheres. It also has like uh, lens distortion. It has all sorts of things uh, to make it uh, pretty, I guess. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, no disrespect, of course, to everyone that is watching the stream. I didn't mean to call anyone a dummy. Uh, we're all dummies. I am still a Nuke dummy. I have been using Nuke for 15 years, and I still feel like I'm a dummy as well to this day, because I'm always learning new things. I'm always learning new compositing things. So, here's this. Like, I'm just going to gamma up so that we can see it a bit better. So normally, if you think about the blur node, the blur node, which looks like this, and it really doesn't have much uh, in terms of options if you look at it. It's literally this. So if you look at the blur node, the blur node is very self-explanatory. You have how many channels you're going to use on the blur. So that means if you want to affect the blur on all channels, if you, for example, have a multi-pass compositing uh, render, for example, or if you just want to apply it to RGB, RGBA, or alpha. Uh, so in this case, I'm just going to do RGBA. No point of me uh, defocusing any other layer uh, apart from that. And then we have, of course, I'm, I'm basically putting my viewer into this. Um, well, actually, uh, actually, uh, one thing I'm going to do here real quick is I'm going to put the blur on the background. I think that would be more beneficial if I do that. Um, so... So consider that, that if I put a blur here, uh, the blur node is going to look like this. So if I start blurring, uh, it often just blurs the pixels. And blurring is nothing more than a spread of those pixels. So if you look closely, if I go really close to this thing, as you can see, the blur is almost like a, a, a kind of glow that basically spreads the pixels. So it picks up the pixels that you see on the image and it starts blurring and blurring and blurring and they become quite soft and then they become very mushy. Now the blur has a few types of filters. If you go to the help file, you can know more about these filters, but there are only four filtering types of blur inside of Nuke. So remember on the transform, when we talked about on the last Nuke for Dummies, we had like a lot more types of filters. Now these filters are different. So you basically have a box filter, which as you can see, it I guess the, the name is self-explanatory. It's like a boxed filter. So everything becomes uh, squared and uh, everything looks like a box. And if you look at it, that's exactly what it is. It's blurring by using a filter that is actually making a squared format while filtering. 
Obviously, it's much more complicated than that, but, you know, I'm not going to get into that. A triangle, of course, just like the name says, it does triangular shapes when you're blurring. And then, of course, you have quadratic, which is basically like a box, but with more uh, sides. And then you have Gaussian, which is the blurred version, which is the one that is the default. So if I set this entire thing to default, it's Gaussian, which is what usually is set um, as the blur. So the problem with using just the blur node is the blur node is very useful for certain things. You know, for example, if you're just like wanting to soften an image or if you just want to blur straight out. But the problem with the blur is the blur makes it everything very mushy, you know, so it doesn't really become very realistic. It's not like a proper defocusing. And in fact, if you go and read the Steve Wright's book uh, or even Ron Brickman's book about compositing, and it doesn't really create a very realistic type of blur. Let's now look at what would happen if I would use a defocus instead. Now, the defocus node is very different from the blur node. And in fact, um, uh, there's a few more options. You have, again, same option as to which channel you want to apply the blur to. And then, of course, you have the type of defocus. Now, when I start defocusing with the defocus node, notice how it looks very different. So let's say that we put 30 of defocus here and we put 30 of blur. So now they're matched in terms of values and, and notice how they look different. Look at how the blur looks, that's how the blur looks and that's how the defocus looks. So obviously the blur is just the blur, you know, just a softening to the image. The defocus though tries, I'm not saying it succeeds. <laughs> I mean, it tries to make it a bit more like a real camera, okay? So it tries to get that kind of bokeh effect. It tries to make it a bit more realistic. And so besides that, you have also the aspect ratio of the blur. So for example, if you're trying to match a lens that would have uh, an aspect ratio of not square, maybe an aspect ratio of 1.3, for example, 1.33, or an aspect ratio of 2, for example, any of those things can be accomplished there. Then, of course, you have the scaling. The scaling is just to make it even more blurred if you want to. Um, so, as you can see here, now this is literally just a bouquet. And for certain shots, this might be fine. It might work just fine. And then, of course, besides that, you have the quality. Now, normally you don't touch the quality. Obviously, the higher the quality it is, the better the blur is. Not that it's going to make much of a difference. If I, for example, put 100 here, the only thing that you really gain here, if you zoom in really closely, and I know I'm... Not, I know I'm I'm basically pixel fucking at this stage. But remember, when I go to 20, you see that you see the bending of the blur of that blur with the defocus. But if I put 100, for example, you don't see the bending anymore. So that's kind of what it does, really. Uh, obviously, the more, you know, like if I, for example, go in here now and look at if I play this back, you'll notice that it's it's kind of roughly doing at 1.6 frames per second. So it takes a bit of time to process and it's a bit slow, um, you know. So it's kind of like you need to kind of consider your options. The It's it's almost like, do you want to have like no banding at all or can you live with it? Uh, it's always a consideration. So if I put 20, for example, it kind of roughly looks the same, but it, then it plays back at six frames per second. So that's like almost four times more than what we had before. So it's a lot faster to process that frame. So it's always a bit about that. And then of course we have last but not least, we have the method. The accelerated method is of course faster than the, pre the full precision. Of course the full pre precision, it will always take longer, but the blur will be a lot more precise. And of course with a higher quality sampling. I never change this, I'll be honest. In fact, I very real, rarely use the defocus node. Uh, but uh, let's uh, now uh, consider this. Let's now consider... So this is if I have the background with a bit of blur. And then this is... So this is a blur of 30. And now I'm going to put the blur... I'm going to put the scaling to default. So set to default to 1. So I have that one or this one. So if you look closely, if you look at these two, the one that looks more realistic is the one with the defocus node because it kind of breaks up the lens a bit more just like you would normally have on a real camera. Now, obviously, 
this is still not good enough. You still need to kind of like, if you really want to have a really good defocus, then we should move on to the Z defocus node because the Z defocus node is a lot more accomplished to try to do these kind of things. The Z defocus node, of course, is a different beast altogether. As you can see, it has a lot more settings, a lot more stuff going on here. This is, in a way, uh, it, it requires a Z defocus pass. It requires a depth pass. So I'm going to like uh, show you that exact thing. You've probably already seen this before with me uh, with other videos that I've done in the past, but um, the depth pass kind of looks like this. Um, I know it doesn't doesn't look much. Uh, it's just like a red square, right? Like if I, it looks like 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 if I have it here, it looks like I'm in hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's nothing else than that like if you really look closely there is actually a lot of information going on here and in fact when you look at it you can kind of see that there's like 2100 values going on here so this is so if you look at the red green and, and blue channels here you'll see that the values are really berserk you know they're really crazy they're like 2,100 uh, values. This is a highly dynamic range image. This is a depth pass. Now, these values are not randomized. They're not like, um, they're not, uh, they're not for nothing, you know. They, they exist because they are the distance to camera. And in fact, if I, if I would bring in the geometry of this shot, we have an environment. This is like that same environment that you just were watching, but this is a proxy environment that was brought in to Nuke so that we can position things, you know, like matte paintings, or for example, um, you know, if you want to position uh, like dust passes, or if you want to position like like geom like 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 uh, ac like uh, stock footage, for example. If I go into my camera view, um, this is actually the entire shot that you just saw on the other in the on the other comp. Uh, in fact, we have the geometry of Alvin. Uh, Alvin is the, the dude here. And then we have the geometry of the background. And then we have a sky as well, which was part of the matte painting. When you look at this, the distance that you are from the camera into this environment is actually going to be the distance that you would have normally uh, on the ZD focus. So I'm going to just remove him for a second here. Uh, because I think it would be nicer if we can just like be a bit faster here and I'm going to like uh, show you what I mean uh, I can't there's no real real way to measure things inside of nuke but if I roughly look at this from this perspective and you look uh, roughly at the values that we have on the floor now we know that each of these squares is a thousand okay the camera is roughly there and then the wall that we were watching is roughly here. So we can kind of assume that it's at least 1,000 plus another 1,000. So it's probably going to be at like 2,100 or 2,000 something. This is the distance from the camera into the geometry. And it matches what you had on Maya. Okay, So that's exactly what we have in Maya. So if I go back into the script that I was showing you, if you look closely... We look at this wall here, which was that CG wall that I just showed you on the 3D system. This wall here, which I look at the depth pass, you see it's around 2,100. Exactly like I just showed you on the geometry. So if you go back to the, to the geometry, you can kind of see that that's one square, two squares, and a little bit more. So that's 2,100. That's the distance. This is going to be very important later on, especially for the depth of field in the ZD focus node, okay? If I go back now to this, um, obviously the ZD focus node, if I pick it up, and let's just pick it up here. And if I have it attached to the image, uh, you know, so let's imagine that we want to defocus this image, okay? So that's the image we want to defocus. Um, and exactly this thing, when I defocus it, as you notice, not much happens. And in fact, it takes forever. You know, like, it's like, what is he doing? What, what the hell is he doing? It's not doing anything. Uh, so, and the reason for this is because uh, Nuke specifically needs a depth pass for the ZD focus to work, okay? So the ZD focus does not work without um, a, a depth pass. And in fact, if you look closely here, it is defocusing something, but it's not defocusing, it's de basically defocusing everything in one go. So if I open up the ZD focus and I, for example, go in here and, and defocus by, let's say we defocus by 10, for example, 
you notice that it's basically not really doing what we are expecting it to do. It's basically doing just a soft focus on everything. It's not, not really like doing exactly the depth-based defocusing that we are expecting. And that's because Nuke is expecting, the ZD Focus node is expecting to have a depth pass. And you can kind of see it here. It says depth channel. So because of that, you need to actually think about this. If this render was a multi-pass EXR, then you would have had other layers. You know, you would have had other passes and other stuff here. Because you don't have, um, you know, because you don't have a depth pass merged into this EXR, I've, we've rendered them separately. Reason why we rendered them separately is because, you know, we were working remotely. We wanted to make sure all the files were smaller so that we can share and sync across all the world with our, all, all of our 20 artists that were working on this project. So for this kind of thing to work on this specific situation, doesn't mean that it will be on your shot, but on this specific situation, you'll need to either use a copy or a channel. Uh, I'm going to use just a copy. It's going to be just easier. So you basically what you want to do is you want to copy the channel from the channel into the stream. The stream being what we call a stream. You, you've done already a few of the Nuke for Dummies, so the stream would be this tree that we're making, always streaming down, going downwards. So in a way, what we want to do is we want to copy this depth pass into the main stream so that we can then use it. You know, So I'm going to open up the copy node, and just like you see on the image here, what you want to do is you want to bring in whatever is on A into the main stream. So A is the one on the left side, B is the one on the right side. So we're going to go to the copy channel, open this up, and say, okay, the depth channel is currently living on my red channel of this render. So I'm going to pick the red channel because I can see it that there is only a red channel on this file because you actually just see the red channel there. There's no other channel happening on this read file. So that's done now. Then you want to make sure it's going to go into the container where you normally have depth point Z passes. So I'm going to open this up and I know it's going to open up a bunch of stuff because these are all the passes I have on my chart right now. So I'm going to pick this one here, the depth Z. The depth Z channel is the one that is the container where normally Nuke is expecting a depth pass to exist. So I'm going to pick that one. I'm going to pick that one up. And now, you know, just like the word, just like the name says on the copy here, you can kind of see it, the copy node. This is the cool thing about Nuke is that the Nuke tends to be very good at transmitting and telling you what's happening. So you can clearly see here that the red channel went from A into depth Z. So that's now done. So now if I look at the result of this, if I look at it, I now have the RGBA, but I also have a depth pass. And this is now the depth pass that has those values, those crazy values, which correspond to the distance to camera when you are trying to do the depth of field. So um, let's now go back to this again. So And so now, if I look at my ZD Focus node, the ZD Focus node is now going to correctly detect the depth pass. I'm just going to put this to 5 again. And in fact, if I look at what I'm doing here, um, I now, you notice that the ZD Focus node has something that we call the focal point. It's like this little dot here. So you can see I can go to the back here and it will pick up just that part. Or I can go to the front and it will defocus this part. Now, here's a consideration. You need to make sure you have the correct mathematic equation for the ZD Focus node to do the proper depth of field depending on what render engine you're using. Sorry that that sounds so complicated. <laughs> it's not complicated, don't worry, we'll go through it. But as I was saying, and you know, as I was saying, we were talking about the ZD Focus node and the fact that ZD Focus node kind of needs to have a depth pass. And so that's what we did here. Like we basically brought in the depth pass, which in this situation was separate. So that means that the ZD Focus pass was actually not merged into the full CG. Now, once that's there, this is still not really done uh, because we have to like make sure the math is correct. So the first thing to consider is the top here. So we have the channels of what we're affecting. We have the RGBA, we have the RGBA, we have the depth. We are probably going to only want to do RGBA because I don't want 
to process any other passes but the RGB. The second thing you want to kind of keep an eye when you're doing something like this is that you want to make sure you're using the graphic card. So obviously this really depends on your system. I have two graphic cards. I have two AMD Radeon Pros W68X, which are each of them with 32 gigs of VRAM. So I have 64 gigs of VRAM and I have two graphic cards. Now, Nuke only works with two graphic cards if they are the same. They have to be exactly the same model. If they are not the same model, it's not going to work, okay? Uh, what's going to happen now is, uh, and of course, if you don't have a graphic card that is compatible, then it won't show up here. So just make sure the depth pass is the Z depth. So remember, we've, we've copied it into the container of depth Z. And then we have the mat. Now, here's what things are a bit interesting. We have options here, which are called direct, depth, far zero, far one, minus direct, minus depth, far minus zero, far, far minus one. What the hell is this? <laughs> You're probably asking to yourself, what the hell is all of this? Well, this is basically the way the ZD Focus node is interpreting the depth pass, the, the masking that we have here. Because remember, the depth pass, I know you didn't see much here, but if I go ahead and color correct it, so I'm going to just like basically show you that depth pass with a color corrector uh, so that you can kind of visualize it. I'm going to like basically put a grade node here. And this grade node is basically set to the furthest object, which in the depth pass here, this is just for visualization purposes, by the way. This is only for visualization, visualization purposes. So if you over the mouse, you can kind of see that my last object is around 5,000, kind of roughly 5,000. If you look down on the RGB area. So the, the most further object, which is kind of these buildings here in the street, they are around 5,000. So if I look at the ZD focus here, you can kind of see that it goes all the way from like 1,500, which is the floor, uh, until 5,000, which is the furthest away. Remember what we showed? I showed you before. It is all to do with the distance to camera, the distance on the 3D scene in scale. Okay. So if I use a color corrector and I put my black point to the furthest point and I put my white point to the closest point, so meaning the closest point would be the floor on the geometry, the furthest point would be the buildings on the back, what the grade node is going to do is it's going to compress and convert the value of 5,000 to 1 and the value of 0 to the, the value of 1,400 to 0. That means you'll have a color corrected, balanced grade uh, version of the Z-depth, and that would be how it would look like. Uh, basically, it looks like this. This is what the Z-depth looks like. Now, remember that you don't need to do this to do depth passes. Uh, there's only two reasons why you would do this, okay? Reason number one would be maybe if you want to use it as a fog pass. So, for example, if you want to color correct your image doing an atmosphere, you know, for example. That would be reason number one that you might consider doing this something like this by color correcting the Z pass so that you can see it. Uh, method number two, the reason you might want to use this is if you have a lot of edge problems on your Z depth, so if you developed edge issues when you're doing the defocusing, then you might want to consider doing this so that then you can do an edge extend so that you can then fix the edges and actually have a much better looking depth pass. Obviously, that second option that I just explained, I have a video on YouTube just about that if you want to watch it. Now, keep in mind that that option is not necessary if you're using deep compositing. So if you have deep information, you could use the, the PG Bokeh node. The PG Bokeh node supports deep, and then you don't have those edge problems and edge issues. And obviously, the edge issues have to do with the fact that when you look at this, whatever is black is furthest from camera, whatever is white is closer to camera. Obviously, sometimes the depth might be the reverse, you know, that's not a problem. So obviously, the reason why we have edge problems is because, just like I showed on the video on YouTube, uh, this is a very old video that I've done a long time ago, in fact. So this video here, how to solve depth of field edge problems in Nuke. So if you want to check it out, you can check it out. Uh, it's funny to watch this video again. This video is really old. Uh, it's actually from 2016. 
<laughs> it's, it's pretty crazy. Already has 50,000 views. That is pretty cool. Oh, I'm going to like my own video. Look at that. I'm going to look my, like my own video. Uh, obviously, the issues with the edges is, like I explained on that video, the fact that it has to do with whatever pixel is darker is further away from camera and whatever pixel is brighter is closer to camera. So anti-aliasation is a big issue on ZD Focus because obviously it doesn't know where it should be. It doesn't know. It's basically wrong, you know. The thing that you have to consider about this is that the depth pass that we, like I said, with the mat... The one you want to use for, for Nuke, for example, if you the default one is far to zero. And if you leave the mouse there, it kind of explains a little bit what it is. Um, not that it explains very well, but it explains that, you know, far to zero is what Nuke and Renderman do. And then you have far to one, which is OpenGL. And then you have far to minus zero, which is Maya Scanline, not Maya Render. Now, the one you want to use is Depth. Depth Z, which is the distance in front of camera, which is what normally, normally, if you haven't changed the shaders, that is what normally happens when you have uh, Arnold or if you use Redshift, which is the case we have here. So the Redshift would be what we're using. So I'm going to change the, the mat to Depth so that it considers what is in front of camera and uses those values to try to do the depth of field. So I'm going to just like really quickly go in here and now look at this depth of field. So I'm going to open up the depth of field node and now I have a focal point. Now the focal point, as you can see, it shows me a focal point, which is X and Y. The X and Y relates to the size of the image. So this is full HD. So of course, if I go here, it's zero. And if I go here, it's 1080 by by 1920. So, so 1920 by 1080. So that's what that reference X, Y is. But notice how if I am on the back building here, it says 4,800. Remember the values that we had here. The 4,500 was what we had on the back there. And that is what relates to when you look at the ZD focus node, when you're doing your focal point, if you focus to there, you are focusing there. Now, I'm going to increase the focusing. I know that this is going to look fake, but that's. I just want to show you this, okay? Consider that... This is going to be the defocus now. So you see, if I put my focal point here, it tells me 4,800. Remember, this is the distance to camera to the position. So obviously, if you really want to do FAC, like if you want to do a rack focus, for example, it is possible for you to use a, a geometry piece, like a, like an X axis inside of Nuke in the 3D system, and then use that axis to drive the position where you're trying to focus something, you know. Now, if, for example, if I put my focal point to the floor here, you'll see that it is uh, at 1,500, which is the value that was closest to camera. And now, as you can see, it's doing a proper depth of field. So if, of course, if I put the depth of field on the middle of the building, now we have the focus on the back and the focus on the front. Now, keep in mind that, unfortunately, the Nuke node, the, the ZD Focus node, is not really like PG Bokeh, where you have the proper f-stop and the proper sensor size of your camera, which is really cool Like when you do that kind of thing. So now that we've talked about how to do the focal point here, uh, let's talk about in the math. Remember, for Arnold and, and, and any kind of render, or even Redshift, any render that relates to the distance to camera, like we saw on the geometry, would have to be depth or better direct. Of course, obviously, if you do direct or far zero, it really depends on the render engine. We're not going to go through this in detail now. So uh, now let's talk about the four options we have here. We have result, photo plane setup, layer setup, and filter. Now, result is, of course, what you're seeing. It's the result. And um, now if I put focal plane setup, this is very interesting. This is like a mask of where you are focusing. So, and of course, at the moment, you just see blue and red. Uh, you don't see anything else. That's because the depth of field is set to zero. Now, if I start opening this up, let me open this up uh, to like maybe zero two, for example. As you can see now, we now have green, we have blue, and we have red. Okay, so let's, for example, say that what does that really mean? You know, what, 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 that, what does that exactly mean? Well, just like the help file says, red would be nearer to camera. Green would be what is focused completely, which is the depth of field of the focal point. So that's like the, the, the equivalent of an f-stop on your lens. And then, of course, we have the further from camera, which is the blue. 
So obviously, if I, for example, put 0 0.2, this would be the equivalent of, a, of an f-stop of like 1.4 or 1.8 or something. And if I now go back to my result, you can kind of see that now I have a larger part in focus. And so the green would help you to guide you through what is in focus. And of course, you can have more in focus. That means the f-stop would be more open. So for example, if I put to 1, that is almost like I'm having an f-stop of 11 or something where almost everything is fully focused, you know? Like, it's, like when you are operating a camera and you have like a focus of f11 or f12, then it's all focused. So that's kind of what this is. And of course, if I drop this all the way to maybe 0 0.5, for example, then I have a lot more defocusing happening and I have a much more, sh like the shallow depth of field changes quite a lot and quite dramatically. I'm going to actually put this even more uh, defocused so that you just see the difference, okay? Uh, so this obviously is a very unrealistic defocusing that I'm creating now, but that's just the point. I'm trying to show you exactly how this operates, you know? Uh, so keep keep that in mind that I know that it's looking a bit unrealistic. So uh, now the other thing that we have also here is the layer setup. Now what is the layer setup? The layer setup has to do with the slices and spacing between the layers. And so if you look closely here down here, we can kind of see that we have one, two, three, four, five. And as I like, let's say that we drop the f-stop. And notice what happens if I put the f-stop, if I drop the f-stop all the way to maybe this much. You know, let's say that we do, uh, you know, an f-stop of 0, 0, 0,015. So that's like an extreme, extreme f-stop, you know. Um, well, uh, unfortunately, there is really not a, a clear way to actually calculate the proper f-stop. At least I have not found one yet. I have not found a way to address the exact f-stop that this thing would relate to. That is why I use PG Bokeh. Like if I look at the PG Bokeh node, for example, in here, we have a proper f-stop. You see aperture of 6, 35 millimeter, and the actual sensor size of the camera. So it is possible on PG Bokeh to be a lot more precise to what type of f-stop you're using. And in fact, PG Bokeh is by far for me, in my view, in my opinion, the best method of doing depth of field inside of Nuke. But I appreciate that it's not free. You need to pay for it. And so that is why we're not focusing our attention on it, on it here. I have done videos in the past where I talked about PG Bokeh. And I think I will probably eventually do more videos about PG Bokeh in the future, I'm sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, just keep that in mind that it is like not really, I have not found a method, a, a clear method of calculating. I'm sure that people that are more intelligent than me, because I'm not very intelligent, I'm a bit, a bit dumb sometimes. So I'm sure people that are a lot more intelligent than me can figure out the calculation of that slider the, the, from zero to one that calculates the f-stop. I'm sure there's a way. But going back to the slices, what I wanted to show you is why do we have to care about the slices? And as you see, if I start moving this around, for example, if I put 0, 0, 001, um, so let's say that we put 0, 0, 001, notice how now my slices or the amount of slices we have on the layering slicing. Now, it's set to automatic at the moment. So if I untick the automatic, let's say that we put slices of 10. So now, if I'm trying to like do the depth of field, the slices will be kind of cut by chunks of 10. So you see, as I move my depth of field, it becomes very chunky. And in, ter in terms, if I start doing rack defocusing, so for example, let's say that I animate. So let's say that we go, let's say we go from the front here. Let's say we wanna animate from this lamp, for example. And so I'm gonna right click a keyframe here. And then maybe 15 frames later, like I will animate all the way to the building here. So I'm gonna do a cassette keyframe here as well. And then maybe 10 frames later, I'm gonna go back into the to the lamp again. And then maybe at the end, let's say that we go back to the building again. So now if I visualize this, you can kind of now see, if I now just wait a few seconds for it to preview. And as you can see, this is now the rack defocus that I'm developing. And as you can see the slices, because the slices are, uh, are done to 10, 
I'm getting a quite extreme uh, rack. And in fact, if I look at the result of this, let's watch this in full screen uh, here. So you see it in full screen. And so now if I play this back, you'll see exactly what I mean, because you'll see it in a lot more detail uh, than normal, because I'm now outputting the video output, um, the full video output uh, from, uh, from the script. So if you look closely here, uh, notice how we have like these really awkward problems going on on the rack defocus. It's almost like we have like from frame to frame, it almost jumps the depth of field. And this is because the slices are not enough. Now, obviously, this is a lot faster because I have only 10 slicers on depth layers. Now, obviously, if I set this to uh, 50, for example, it will take a lot longer to process, but it will be a lot smoother. So if I now preview this, for example, this is now with 50 slices and not 10 slices of layer spacing, then it looks better. Now, keep in mind, of course, that... This is only important if you're doing a rack defocus. If you're not doing a rack defocus, no one cares. <laughs> if you're not doing rack, it doesn't matter, the slicing. Then that's, that is why the default is automatic. So you see, that's a lot smoother. Now the rack focus is a lot more subtle. And in fact, if I go all the way to 100, obviously there will be a time that this thing will stop making sense. Like the more you put the slices, now I'm at 100 of slices. Um, so if I now go into here, you'll see now I have 100 set to the layering slices. Um, obviously, the more slices you put, the slower it gets. Um, but the quality improves substantially. So if I'll, this will be the last one I'm going to... I know I'm going really granular with this note. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you're not expecting this on this, uh, but this is Nuke for Dummies, right? I need to be quite granular. I need to go quite deep into it. Otherwise, what's the point? <laughs> so, you know, obviously this is now almost a tilt and shift image with uh, architectural photography. So this is not realistic at all, okay? Keep that in mind. Because they are set to 100, it's going to take forever for it to process. It's going to take a very long time to process the image. I mean, now, but as you can see, the good thing with the 100 that it's become so much more smooth, that depth of field effect, okay? I'm going to just put it to auto. And as you can see, if you zoom in, 100 gives you this kind of like really nice smooth edge. And if I put an automatic, it drops the quality. You see, it looks like bending almost. I'm going to leave it in automatic because I'm going to remove the animation because we don't need to like do this right now. Now, the other thing that exists here is the filter shape setup. So the filter shape setup is what we call bokeh. Now, for those of you that don't know anything about photography, keep in mind bokeh is very important. Bokeh is the shape of the lens, right? So if I go into Google, so this is what bokeh is. Bokeh basically is the shape, the regular shape that you have inside the iris of the lens. So the lenses usually are built by shapes, but they usually have blades inside the lens. Those blades, which are the iris that opens up and close, depending on the f-stop, will provide this kind of thing. So, for example, if you have an f-stop 1.4, you have blades. Actually, uh, uh, you know, you can see the shapes of the blade on the lens uh, of the iris. But if you have f22, everything is much more sharp. And, of course, you don't see the blades at all, you know. So, now... This entire thing has to do with the shape of the iris. So on each of the lens, depending on what type of lens you're using, you might have like you might have different uh, shapes. You know, for example, if I go to, you can kind of see that, for example, this one, this is a lens that inside the iris is shaped to five blades. So that's why the bouquet would have this shape there. This, for example, on the other hand, the iris inside the lens would have eight blades. And so often what we do as compositors is that a lot of times we try to figure out how many blades we have on a lens. And this is really important to find out. You can literally find this out by going to the website of the manufacturer of the lens. And then you can know how many blades it has. And then you will know exactly if you need to put five, you need to put six or seven or eight or 12 or whatever it will be. So in this case, the filter shape is corresponding to what you see here on the filter type. At the moment, it's a disc. It's just round. But if you put blade, then you have the blades. And at the moment, by default, it's five blades. This would be the depth of field blade 
of, of our shape. So and if I go back now to result, you'll see that this, I'm gonna just defocus even more, okay? So I'm gonna just like go nuts with this so that I can show you the shape. So as you can see here, the shape of that, of that uh, wait, give it a second. <laughs> this is why I keep telling people all the time. I keep, I keep telling people all the time, do you wanna be a composter? Oh, great. Oh, what, what should I do if I wanna be a composter? And, and people always ask me, and they say, oh, I need to learn Nuke, right? And I always answer them the same way. No, actually, you should not learn Nuke first. Go and learn photography. <laughs> so learn about lenses, learn about lenses, learn about f-stops, learn about ISOs, learn about sensors, learn about how lenses and f-stops relate to speeds and shutters. Learn all that shit, and then go back and learn Nuke. <laughs> so that you can kind of like go back, apply all that photography knowledge into Nuke. And remember, it will take time because Nuke takes ages, you know. I've been using Nuke since 2006. So I've been using Nukes now for six, 17 years, I guess. So since 2006, I've been using Nuke and it's been taking me 17 years to learn Nuke. I'm still learning Nuke <laughs> and I'm still going through it. Uh, and no one learns already with everything, you know. It takes it takes a long time. It takes a long time, um, you know, to go through it. So going back to this, as you can see, the bouquet is with five blades. Now, if I put like three blades, you'll see just three blades on the shape. If I put five blades, you'll just see five blades. If I put eight blades, you'll see eight blades shape of the bouquet. Now, keep in mind, of course, the, blur, the more blades you have, the more round it becomes. So then it, you'll stop noticing that it's even blades, you know. So, so that's what you also should keep in mind. Um, so, okay. And then, of course, you have round. I'm going to go back and put this to uh, the result. So if I now go back to filter shape, you see, this is the shape that I'm doing. But obviously, you also have the roundness of that shape. You can change that as well. You can rotate it. You can do an inner side as well. You can do an inner feather as well. You can do an inner uh, uh, brightness as well. You can have catadotropic uh, filtering as well. You can also have gamma correction in bloom as well. All those things will help you to try to match the bouquet of your camera. And so if I now go back to my result, you'll see, and by the way, notice how the bending box, the bounding box is quite large now. That is because I'm now blurring so much that is actually going beyond the limits of my image. To, to fix that, you probably want to consider putting a crop node to try to crop that up, you know, so that you don't process things that you don't need. Uh, so I'm going to actually do that. Um, so you see, now my shape is starting to look more realistic. It's now, now starting to look more like a photography shape because now I'm having all these bounces from the inner feather and the inner shader and also the gamma correction in bloom is also helping me to develop that kind of like bouquet effect that you usually have on a scene. And of course, the more I put blurriness here, the more you'll see the bouquet effect, but obviously it becomes even more slow. And you can also uh, have an, amor an amorphic lenses, of course, that is set by the blade of the aspect ratio. So for example, if you're shooting, if you're trying to match CG to a thing, something that was photographed with a 1.3 aspect ratio, then you need to put 1.33 here, and then the aspect ratio will be 1 to 43, and of course, if you have an aspect ratio of 2, then you'll have to put 2 here, and of course, you have, well, sorry, it's the other way around, <laughs> sorry, if you want to, like, have a factor of 2 of aspect ratio, then you would put 0 0.5, that would be what it would be, sorry about that. So all of that is really important. And then, of course, last but not least, this is looking like shit, by the way. <laughs> so I'm going to just go back and set this to default as it should be. Now, uh, the last but not least is that you can also bring in your own, uh, um, your, you know, your own shape if you want to uh, from uh, Copilot. Um, so from Copilot, this is a blade. It's an actual photography of a blade of, of, a, of an actual um, of an actual bouquet because you could always write you can always like um, um, uh, wrote it wrote rotoscope it from a from a plate now the only thing you need to do for this to work is you, you do need to put a shuffle because you need to provide some kind of alpha channel so I'm going to provide the red channel as an alpha so I'm basically piping the red into alpha so that we also have an alpha channel here and now, if I look into this, uh, what will happen is that if you want, the ZV focus node could have a filter. So if you don't want to use 
the filter that I've just made here, you could put whatever you want as a filter. And that, of course, means that you would have to tell him. Because remember, we have an option of being a disk, an option of being a blade, or an option of being an image, which would be that. So you could also use an image. And that would give you something like this. It will take a bit more time to process if you just give it a second. So now that is looking at that bouquet shape instead of using the one that we've created. So that's the difference. That's the blade that I've created, and that is the image that I'm using. Obviously, you can use whatever image you want for being... You can even use little square, like little hearts if you want to. doesn't really matter. <laughs> now, last but not least is the size and the maximum. Now, remember when I was looking at the, the different depth of fields here, um, you know, when I look at this. Now, at some point, when you're looking at depth of field, after a while, depth of field doesn't really do anymore. Like, after a while, depth of field goes into the infinite. And that is why you have those options there of size and maximum. So size is how much blur you're going to give it. And then maximum is the clamp limit of what you're trying to defocus. So if I go in here, notice how if I'm setting this to, to 10, that's how much I'm defocusing. So let's focus here on this lamp, for example. This is how much I'm defocusing. I'm not defocusing much. Now 20, let me let me just go to 100 again, 100. And then I'm going to put 100 here. So now effectively I'm blurring by 100 and the maxim clamp is 100. But if I put 200, then you see that the maxim, if I put 300, for example, after a while it doesn't even do anything. So if I put 10 of size here and I put, for example, let's say that we put 20 of maxim, it basically clamps the amount of blurriness. It doesn't really show here on this specific image because you know I don't have a very large environment, so you can't really see a very far away depth of field. But that kind of really concludes my representation of the depth of field node. Uh, I'm just gonna like, pick it up and let's go back here and just look at the results of this. So I'm gonna put a merge node just to show you the difference between all of them. So I have Remember what we started with on the beginning of the stream. One, this is just a blur node. So that's the one that doesn't really look nice. It looks very washed out. That's just the blur node. That's with the defocus node. So this is the difference. Looks a bit better. And then third, last but not least, is the depth pass. So you see blur, defocus, depth pass. Obviously, the depth pass progressively, progressively blurs. You see the floor is not very blurred. This is a bit more blurred. That's a bit more blurred. That's very blurred. So you have a fallout of depth of field happening in the scene instead of just a straight blur from start to finish. Let's talk about how would we apply the depth of field if we had multiple layers, right? Because you see here, as you can see here, you know, yes, the background looks nice, but then he, the guy, the dude, is actually not defocused because... He has a separate depth pass. And so because he has a separate depth pass, it's kind of like we need to have... It, here's the thing. It's the choice. It's a choice, of course. It's a choice between you. Um, you can either have the depth pass separated and you can have two layers separated. And I think in a way, this entire thing really depends on your pipeline. It depends on what you're trying to achieve. Uh, if you have deep compositing, you probably don't have to separate them, but keep in mind that I prefer to have more control. So I've rendered the background separately from the foreground. But, of course, this has some ramifications on your pipeline, because if you render in CG the foreground and the background separately, then you need to deal with the consequences if you want to do depth of field. Then you need to actually have two depth of field nodes working to try to get the depth of field on the room and then the depth of field on the person. So just keep that in mind, that that is a, a bit of a difficulty. Having that in mind, I'm just gonna go and show you this in action. So I'm gonna show you that using this thing here. So I'm gonna show you, this is the actual script. So this is the full production script of that shot uh, that you're seeing on screen right now. I'm just going to really do a really rundown of what we've done here. So this would be coming the CG. This is the actual background CG, as you can see. This is with baked motion blur, by the way. So we have baked motion blur. We have some particles. We have all sorts of things here. 
the background layer, which has an alpha channel uh, as well. So that's layer number one. And then, of course, I have just have my all, all my shaders. You know, I have like the, you know, like the, the GI and then I have like the reflections and and then I have like the reflections and then we have the speculars and all the different AOVs and passes. We're not going to go through this now. I just want to kind of show you a little bit of how that goes. And then, of course, we have the crypto mats, the object IDs, the utilities, you know, all that stuff. What happens here, once I rebuild my shader and I do all of that, what I will do here is I will have a depth of field happening in one and two positions. So, first of all, here I have a 3D system that has my sky. So, this is my sky that I've comped on the background there. So, that's like the sky, okay? So the sky, which is nothing more than if I if I go here and I go to here, this is nothing more than just the sky on a card. Okay, so there's the camera, and then I have the sky on a sphere, and so that is my sky camera. And then of course my camera move does this. You see. So obviously if I go through my camera's perspective, that's what we're watching. We're watching the sky on a sphere wrapped, so that we can kind of like go through it and show it. Okay. So um, going, going back into this, that output, of course, outputs it to the scanline render. Now, then, I also have, you know, some foreground mountains as well, which I've merged here. These are just some mountains, which I also merge a little bit with the background. So now I have not only the sky, I'm going to just gum it up a bit so you can see it. But also have some mountains, some matte painting mountains. That would be like the furthest background, really, for the whole thing. And so, this entire thing is now there. The sky, the mountains, and everything. And then, of course, I merge my foreground. And so now, I have my background, which is the sky, the mountains, the CG, all of it together. And now, I'm going to apply the depth of field just to this section of the layers, okay? So that means I have the background, together with the foreground, together with the wood, together with the particles, and that then becomes, this becomes then depth of field, it becomes then defocused. So that is what I have here. I'm using PG Bokeh, I'm using an actual Bokeh image, and then I have PG Bokeh, which is extremely slow, by the way, just just give you an idea. PG Bokeh is here, and it's set to an f-stop of 1.2. And it's set to focal of 16. So this is because my lens in Maya is 16 millimeter. And it's a 35 millimeter backplate that I'm using in my Maya scene. And I'm using an f-stop of 1.2. So that's kind of the thing <laughs> there. And so, of course, this is extremely slow, but it doesn't matter. So this is the defocused version of that. And if I go back here to the first frame, PG bouquet is quite slow. Okay, so but you can see that we have the bouquets here. Look at that. There's beautiful bouquets. They're actually all there. And I'm defocusing both the sky, the clouds, and the background barn as well, which would be defocused as separate. Now, also in here, as you notice here, I'm basically defocusing using like the focal plane of 100, which is the distance to the camera if I was having the geometry here. Then goes back to the character itself. So this is the raw CG of the character, right? So this is the dude with occlusion. So this is just the render on Redshift of the main character. So this is basically the CG guy done in Redshift and he's like breaking up the barn with his mighty sword and he has baked motion blur. Again, I have all my passes, you know, all the different layers, all the different reflections, all the different stuff going on here. I then build the whole thing. Uh, I also have some scratches that I've used. We're not going to go through this today. But, you know, I've, done, I've developed like a scratch pass inside of Nuke using UVs. And I know it looks silly as hell. It looks really ridiculous, doesn't it? But this is kind of like... This is kind of like, uh, um, um, you know, like a scratch pass that then I would use on top of the CG just to kind of make it look better, really. Like, that's the whole point. So then, of course, I build this entire thing. Um, and then, as you can see here at the end of it, we're not going to go through this today. But you can kind of see the scratches kind of help. Like, I'm going to show you where the scratches come in. The scratches come in to here, I believe. That's the scratches, yeah. So you see here, that's the scratch layer. 
that is basically just, I know it's a bit exaggerated, but with the motion blur and with everything else, it looks just fine. So this is the scratch layer that I've used. You don't need to use Nuke for this, of course, but I, I did use a UV for this. Um, you don't need to use Nuke, of course, um, but this is basically this. It's basically the the UVs with a scratch layer, and then I basically have this as my scratch layer, and then this goes all to the UV tiling, uh, and then eventually, uh, I know this is, but I probably need to switch on the light so that we can see the geometry. Yeah, so this is the the geometry that I brought into Nuke. Of this is a cache, of course. It's not the, like all of the detailed. And this is like the loaded texturing UVs of that dirt pass that I have there. You know, like, like whatever. It's like, blah, 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 blah. it's like a pass that I've used there. It's not really important. It's, I think you get the picture. So it's like some scratches. And this is way beyond Nuke for Dummies, by the way. I'm just like showing you the script. Um, and so this, of course, has, it looks like this, right? Like it's baked motion blur, but it has no depth of field. Now for this, I am using the same bouquet. Now notice how this bouquet has like a little C there because it's cloned. That means that this bouquet and the bouquet of the background, the PG bouquet of the background, they all match. They both match, see? So I have both of them with the same values, both of them with the same lenses, both of them with the same chromatic aberration, both of them with the same kernel. Everything is the same on both of them because they are defocusing the background and the foreground separately, but as a, as a whole. Now, I do have something else here. I am pulling the depth, doing a color edge so that I can extend it. This is what I was telling you about on the video. This extension here that I'm using the color edge to extend, this is for me to fix the edge problems on the depth of field. Now, this is not going to be covered today, okay? We'll eventually do that, but you can also watch that video on YouTube because it will be there. I'm just gonna mention that. And of course, that gives me the depth of field. So this is now the depth of field. Very nice depth of field, as you can see. Um, and you can kind of see that it's like, you know, blurring the, the wings there. It's blurring the front there. This is a very noisy render, by the way, but it doesn't matter uh, because the depth of field is kind of helping it to make it a bit more realistic anyway. Now, this is an extreme lens. And so now when I merge all of this together with the background, because remember the background here is already defocused, pre-defocused with that PG bokeh. When I'm saying I'm using the PG bokeh, remember I, I could also use the Z defocus node. It doesn't need to be, you know, it doesn't need to be like, like the, the depth, but it doesn't need to be the PG bokeh node. It can be the Z defocus node. Then merges with this. So now they both match in terms of depth of field. You see, this wing is already defocused. I already have like a bouquet effect here. And then the background is even more defocused. So now this is now the combination of the two layers. I'm going to just like bring it down here. So this is now both the background. So this is now with the sky, the mountains, the CG. And then also, as you know, it also has the character as well. All of them with the two depth of field nodes. This is slow as hell, as you can see. The Pajibokeh is very slow. So the strategy here that I've done is that I've used two depth of field nodes, two Pajibokehs. You could use two ZD focus nodes. Uh, but yeah, so that, that's really wanted to, I wanted to approach and show you this. Yeah, this is going to take too long, so I'm not going to wait for this to happen. This is now rendered, but actually you can see that it's, it's looking quite nice. Well, I might what I might do is I might go back. While this is loading on the background, I might go to the other script and then show you something because I have enough RAM to do that. So I'm going to just show you on something else on the other script. Remember what I was telling you about the depth pass? The depth pass here, uh, this is really like a little side note. Remember when I told you that the depth pass is really actually very useful for you to use on fog, for example? So this is what I did here. So for this shot here, uh, what I've done is I have the depth pass. I then color corrected it so I could see it. And then I piped it into a grade node with the mask input. Now this mask input is set to red. And then I am using the lift node. So you see, this is what it's developing. So basically this, the, using the depth pass, allows you to kind of like make some fog elements. I'm just gonna like set this to default. I'm gonna set this to red and I'm gonna like show you this happening. So you see, obviously I have to invert my mask. 
And so this is one way of doing a fog, almost like a Silent Hill fog, would be to use a depth pass to control it like that. Now, the, the thing with this is that um, I know it looks fine. And of course, if you want to colorize the fog, you can always like put a bit of color into it. Now, this might look correct, but if you zoom in, you'll see that there is a lot of anti-lization issues. This is the reason for this is because the, the depth pass tends to not really work on edges, you know, because it doesn't match the real edges. Uh, so if you look at the CG, if I look at the alpha channel, that's the CG edges. And then the depth map doesn't really match the same edges, you see? If I, like, bring that up, you see that? The edges don't match. That's because it can't be antilized, the depth pass. So this then becomes a problem if you're trying to do a fog. You can kind of get away with it. If you, for example, blur it a bit or, you know, like you can put a little blur there and maybe, maybe get away with it. If I put like a, a two of blur or something, you can probably get away with it, especially if it's like in the distance. So that is, that could potentially work. You can either use maybe a blur or, or you know, you can maybe use uh, like a soften. So the depth pass here. The problem with this is that, of course, the edges are a problem. So this is why I would really highly advise you to do stuff like this. So this is a fake depth pass. This is a depth pass that is rendered as a shader inside of Redshift, in this case. You can also do it in Arnold as well. This is handmade, custom-made as a ramp. Basically, just set a ramp and just set it to the distance to camera. So in this case, we have... The red channel, nothing. Green channel is the Y depth. The blue channel is the Z depth. I like to do these kind of things. I always ask my CG artist to do this because this will then provide me a fully anti-aligned with the same filtering quality of the CG of the fog pass. So I always use this to fog. So if I, for example, look at this, for example, uh, you know, if I look at that, that would now give me the perfect fog with the edge problems fixed instead of having those problems that you saw before. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. This was just for me to show you how you can use depth passes for fog. While we were waiting for this to render, that didn't really work out. That was not my plan. But, you know, it doesn't really matter. I think I think we're going to wrap up soon anyway. Um, you know. And this is going to conclude really what we were showing. So this is now the full preview um, of the depth pass that I just created using the two layers. So you see, you see, it makes it look much more realistic by having a nice depth of field effect on this render, of course. Of course, this is not photo real. This is not supposed to be photo real anyway. This is like a like a, a stylized render, really. It's a stylized shot.